Good morning, boys and girls. We get to start our new novel today. I hope you all are excited to read it. Um, this is a wonderful story called Farmer Boy by Laura Ingalls Wilder. So how many of you have read Little House in the Big Woods? If you were at our school last year, then you would have read it as a second grader. Um, little House in the Big Woods is about this little girl, Laura, who lives in Wisconsin um, with her family. And she has several other books in the series. Um, and she wrote her own life story as she and her family start to uh, um, move west. Now, this book is not about Laura at all. It's the only one in the whole series that doesn't have Laura, even though she's the one who wrote it. And that's because this book is about the man she was going to, she would eventually marry. His name was Almanzo, and this is his story um, of his childhood living in New York State as um, a young boy who is the son of a farmer and lived in a farming family. So um, this story has Laura um, and Almanzo Wilder is the man that she married. Um, in this little book, um, some of you might have the same version of this has the years that the people lived as well. So we can kind of figure out, well, we know the publication date when this book was published, um, but we can also figure out the time period that this is set in. Now, Almanza Wilder lived from 1857 to 1949. Laura lived from 1867 to 1957. Now this book was written in copyright 1933. Right. And at the very beginning of this book, I'll present over. It was 67 years ago that the story begins. Okay, so 33 is when it was published 67 years ago. Does anybody know what 67 years before 1933 would be. You might be doing some mental math right now. It'll be 34 years before 1900. So that would be 1966. Okay. Or I mean, 1866. So that is the time that this book is set. So Almanzo was about eight years old when this story was set. We're going to hear about what life is like for him and his three siblings. Let's begin. Now, it was January in northern New York State, 67 years ago. Snow lay deep everywhere. That probably seems quite familiar to what we're going through right now. Right, New York State is much more likely to get snow like this on a regular basis. Can you imagine if this, what you're seeing outside, I can show you outside of my window right now, which probably looks pretty similar to a lot of your windows right now having to film this in my room right now, but, oh, snow everywhere. That was typical for Almanzo's family on a regular basis. That's what their winter was like. So, Snow lay deep everywhere. It loaded the bare limbs of oaks and maples and beeches, all types of trees. It bent the green boughs of cedars and spruces, think of like a Christmas tree, down into the drifts. Very similar to what we're having right now. Billows of snow covered the fields and the stone fences. Down long road through the woods, a little boy trudged to school with his big brother, Royal, and his two sisters, Eliza Jane and Alice. Eliza Jane is one name, by the way. Now, Royal was 13 years old. Eliza Jane was 12. And Alice was 10. Now, Almanzo was the youngest of all. And this was his first going to school because he was not quite nine, year, nine years old. So he's eight, almost nine, just about the same age as all of you. So let's see, we've got Royal, 13 years old. Eliza Jean is 12, Alice is 10, and Almanzo is eight, almost nine. 
Now he had to walk fast to keep up with the others, and he had to carry the dinner pail. Royal ought to carry it, he said. He's bigger than I be. Royal strode ahead, big and manly in boots, and Eliza Jane said, Mel Manzo, that's her nickname for El Monzo, um, or maybe it would be pronounced Monzo. No, Monzo, it's your turn to carry it now because you're the littlest. So why does he have to carry the dinner pail? Apparently it's because he's the youngest. Do you think that's a rule from um, the mom or is it a rule from like the kids? If it was my guess, I feel like they are the ones putting it on him. All the, um, the big brother and older sisters are all saying, you should do it, you're the youngest. Now, Eliza Jane was bossy. She always knew what was best to do and she made Almanzo and Alice do it. Almanzo hurried behind Royal and Alice hurried behind Eliza Jane and the deep paths made by bobsled runners. On each side, the soft snow was piled high. The road went down a long slope, then it crossed a little bridge and went on for a mile through the frozen woods to the schoolhouse. The cold nipped Almanzo's eyelids and numbed his nose, but inside his good woolen clothes, he was warm. So it's probably about as cold as it's been lately, you know, about zero or zero degrees or even colder in the negatives. And they are walking to school. Can you imagine that? He has some warm clothes on, woolen clothes to keep himself warm. He's not complaining, um, but that is a long trek in very cold weather and in thick snow like we have. They were all made from the wool of his father's sheep, all of his wool clothes. His underwear was creamy white. Kind of silly that they describe his underwear, but but mother had dyed the wool for his outside clothes. Meaning it doesn't really matter if his underwear is white, but his mom wants everything else to be nice and red. Butternut holes had dyed the thread for his coat and his long trousers. That would be like a nice rich brown color since it's a butternut. Now, then mother had woven it and she had soaked and shrunk the cloth into heavy, thick, full cloth. Not wind, nor cloth, nor even a drenching rain could go through the good full cloth that mother made. So it's kind of weatherproof, but it's just homemade clothes. For Almanzo's waist, she had dyed a fine wool as red as a cherry and she had woven a soft, thin cloth. It was light and warm and beautifully red. Almanzo's long brown pants buttoned to his red waist with a row of bright bass brass buttons all around his middle. The waist's collar buttoned snugly up to his chin and so did his long coat of brown full cloth. Mother had made his cap of the same brown full cloth with cozy ear flaps that tied under his chin. Do any of you have hats like that with ear flaps and then it comes down to tie there? That would be a really nice warm hat. And his red mittens were on a string that went up the sleeves of his coat and across the back of his neck. That was so he couldn't lose them. Have any of you seen ones like that before? These mittens are tied together and they run all the way through the coat. Long string. He um, wore one pair of socks pulled snug over the legs of his under drawers. So that's basically like kind of leggings um, or long underwear that would go like normal underwear, but all the way down his legs too. And then he's got a big thick pair of socks on top of that. And then there's another pair outside the legs of his long brown pants. So two pairs of socks, two pants basically as well. And he wore moccasins. They were exactly like the moccasins that Indians wore. And by Indians here, it means Native Americans like we're learning about in history class right now. Do you all know what moccasins are? Here is a picture of what some modern day moccasins would look like. Here's some Native American ones. So they're soft shoes. Even the bottom of, the, of, bottom of these shoes is soft, like a suede kind of. Um, so they could be warm, they can be very durable, um, but it's not like a boot or a tennis shoe that has a thick sole. Oop, lost my place. Now girls tied heavy veils over their faces when they went out in winter. 
But Almanzo was a boy, and his face was out in the frosty air. So the girls got to cover their face, kind of like a, wearing a face mask. But he had his face out in the cold, and imagine temperatures like we're having right now, and the wind hitting him in the face. <sighs> well, his cheeks were red as apples, and his nose was redder than a cherry. And after he had walked a mile and a half, he was glad to see the schoolhouse. It stood lonely in the frozen woods at the foot of Hard Scrabble Hill. Smoke was rising from the chimney, and the teacher had shoveled a path through the snowdrifts to the door. Five big boys were scuffling in the deep snow by the path. Almanza was frightened when he saw them. Royal pretended not to be afraid, but he was. They were the big boys from the Hard Scrabble settlement, and everybody was afraid of them. So five big boys, um, probably late teenage years, so like high schoolers. They smashed little boy's sleds just for fun. They would catch a little boy and swing him by his legs, then let him go headfirst into the deep snow. Sometimes they made two little boys fight each other, though the little boys didn't want to fight and be begged and begged to be let off. These big boys were 16 or 17 years old, there you go, and they came to school only in the middle of the winter term. So they only came at certain times and they're picking on these little kids, like making them fight and breaking their sleds. They came to thrash the teacher and break up the school. Thrash means to hit or beat up. So they want to come in just to beat up the teacher and pick on all these kids. They boasted that no teacher could finish the winter term in that school and no teacher ever had. Now this year, the teacher was a slim, pale young man. His name was Mr. Course. He was gentle and patient and never whipped little boys because they forgot how to spell a word, which no teachers would do now, but that's what was common at the time. But he's very patient. Almanza felt sick inside when he thought how the big boys would beat Mr. Course. Mr. Course wasn't big enough to fight them. So he is a young man, maybe a little older than these boys, but he's much smaller than them. There was a hush in the schoolhouse and you could hear the noise the big boys were making outside. By the way, this is a one room schoolhouse where this teacher is teaching little kids like Almanzo, who's about your age, and all the way up to high school boys. All of these people are in the not only the same school building like we have, but the same room, same classroom. Now, the other pupils, which means students, stood whispering together by the big stove in the middle of the room. So they used that to uh, heat up the whole room. Mr. Kors sat at his desk. One thin cheek rested on his pale, his slim hand, and he was reading a book. He looked up and said pleasantly, Good morning. Royal and Eliza Jane and Alice answered him politely, but Almanzo did not say anything. He just stood by the desk looking at Mr. Course. Mr. Course smiled at him and said, do you know I'm going to going home with you tonight? That would be an odd thing for a teacher to say. Imagine if I said that to you. Almanzo was too troubled to answer. Yes, Mr. Course said. It's your father's turn. Father's turn to do what? Every family in the district boarded the teacher for two weeks. Boarded means they gave the teacher a place to stay. So the teacher doesn't have a home. This teacher goes from student to student's house for two weeks at a time living with them. That would be a pretty crazy um, way to live life. But there are some people um, maybe they, these people were not able to afford it, or they actually don't even teach in the same place always, so they have to go from place to place. But that's the way it was done. Um, my great-grandmother was a teacher in the early 1900s, and I think that she had to do this as well. She would stay with family members of the students that she taught. Now, he went from farm to farm till he had stayed two weeks at each one. Then he closed school for that term. When he said this, Mr. Course rapped on his desk with his ruler. It was time for school to begin. All the boys and girls went to their seats. The girls sat on the left side of the room and the boys sat on the right side. 
with the big stove and wood box in the middle between them. The big ones sat in the back seats, the middle-sized ones in the middle seats, and the little ones in the front seats. All the seats were the same size. You know how we have different chair sizes for kindergartners versus high schoolers? Well, the big boys could hardly get their knees under their desks. It was too small for them. And the little boys couldn't rest their feet on the floor. They were just swinging. Almanzo and Miles Lewis were the primer class. So they sat on the very front seat and they had no desk. They had to hold their primers in their hands. Then Mr. Course went to the window and the primer is like um, a little workbook um, with like some letters to write, possibly as they're learning maybe cursive or they're doing their math facts. Now then Mr. Course went to the window and tapped on it. The big boys clattered into the entry, jeering and loudly laughing. They burst the door open with a big noise and swaggered in. Big Bill Ritchie was their leader. He was almost as big as Almanzo's father. His fists were as big as Almanzo's father's fists. He stamped the snow from his feet and noisily trampled to a back seat. The four other boys made all the noise they could too. Mr. Course did not say anything. No whispering was permitted in school and no fidgeting. Everyone must be perfectly still and keep his eyes fixed on his lesson. So doesn't matter what kind of commotion is happening around him, Almanzo knows what the rule is to keep your eyes focused on the lesson. Almanzo and Miles held up their primers and tried not to swing their legs. Their legs grew so tired that they ached, dangling from the edge of the seat. So they also learned just not to complain. I'm gonna look up, I'm pretty sure that it's pronounced primer when it's that kind of book, but I wanna make sure it's not primer. Mm, okay, maybe it is more primer. Okay, we'll say it that way. Here's, by the way, a picture of what this primer would look like. Hmm, so we've got like different words that start with B, different ones that start with C. Okay. So the big boys clattered into the entry, jeering and loudly laughing. Bill Ritchie is the leader of the crew. Um, so Mr. Course did not say anything to them. You know, most teachers would get on to these boys for being very rude and for disturbing the class. No whispering was permitted in school. Um, now Alexander and Miles held up their primers and tried not to swing their legs. Their legs grew so tired that they ached, just dangling from the edge of the seat. Sometimes one leg would kick suddenly before Almanzo could stop it. Then he tried to pretend that nothing happened but he could feel Mr. Course looking at him. In the back seats, the big boys whispered and scuffled and slammed their books. Mr. Course said sternly, a little less disturbance, please. For a minute, they were quiet. Then they began again. They wanted Mr. Course to try to punish them. Why would they want that? They're wanting to see if Mr. Course actually will follow through with the things he says. Now, when he did, all five of them would jump on him. At last, the primer class was called and Almanzo could slide off the seat and walk with Miles to the teacher's desk. Mr. Course took Almanzo's primer and gave them words to spell. When Royal had been in the primer class, he had often come home at night with his hands stiff and swollen from writing so much. The teacher also had beaten the palm with a ruler because Royal did not know his lesson. So these um, even little like second, third graders would be writing for so long. And if there was a mistake, their hand was beaten. Then father said, if the teacher has to thrash you again, Royal, I'll give you a thrashing you'll remember. So now he is also hard on Royal. Thankfully, we don't hit students in, sc um, in school like this. And hopefully our parents don't do this either. But it was a good lesson for Royal. He 
had to do the best he could so that he wasn't going to have his hand hit by this ruler. So made him work a lot harder in his classes. But um, thankfully that doesn't happen anymore. But Mr. Course never beat a little boy's hand with his ruler. So that's what happened with Royal. But this new teacher, Mr. Course, does not ever beat a hand with a ruler. When Almanzo could not spell a word, Mr. Course said, stay in at recess and learn it. That's a much better consequence than beating someone's hand with a ruler. It's just stay in at recess and learn what you didn't know before. Now at recess, the girls were let out first. They put on their hoods and cloaks and quietly went outdoors. After 15 minutes, Mr. Course rapped on the window and they came in, hung their wraps in the entry and took their books again. Then the boys could go out for 15 minutes. They rushed out shouting into the cold. The first out began snowballing the others. All that had sleds scrambled up Hard Scrabble Hill. They flung themselves stomach down on the sleds and swooped down the long steep slope. When we have snow days in person, um, you know, you're at home or maybe if school still happens, we wouldn't go outside in the snow, but they get to just play in the snow for their recess time. That's pretty fun. Maybe some of you can play during your kind of free time. You don't have necessarily recess, but play during your free time today. They upset into the snow, meaning they spilled over into the snow. They ran and wrestled and threw snowballs. Have any of you been throwing snowballs with this snow yet? And washed one another's faces with snow. And all the time they yelled as loud as they could. When Almanzo had to stay in his seat at recess, he was ashamed because he was kept in with the girls. At noontime, everyone was allowed to move about the schoolroom and talk quietly. Eliza Jane opened the dinner pail on her desk. It held bread and butter and sausage, donuts and apples, and four delicious apple turnovers. Wow, that's quite a good lunch. Their plump crusts filled with melting slices of apple and spicy brown juice. Oh, yum. After Almanzo had eaten every crumb of his turnover and licked his fingers, he took a drink of water from the pail with a dipper in it on a bench in the corner. So there's just this bucket or pail with a dipper in it, which is kind of like a ladle. And that's how he got his water. Same with everybody else. Um, some school rooms would instead have something just on um, outside of a building, uh, like a spigot that you would have a hose connected to. And that's how they'd get their water. And there is a really cool one room schoolhouse actually close to Beaver Lake in um, Arkansas. And it wasn't able, we couldn't do it as um, a field trip last year because of COVID and we won't be able to this year either. But that would be a fun family outing if you're interested to see what a one room schoolhouse is like. It doesn't actually have real students inside of it, um, but they can have people come um, just to see what it would have been like. It used to be operating just like this though and it looks exactly like they're describing. Then he put on his cap and coat and mittens and went out to play. The sun was shining almost overhead. All the snow was a dazzle of sparkles and the wood haulers were coming down hard scrabble hill. High on the bobsleds piled with logs, the men cracked their whips and shouted to their horses and the horses shook jingles from their strings of bells. All the boys ran shouting to fasten their sleds to the bobsleds runners and boys who had not brought their sleds climbed up and rode on the loads of wood. They went merrily past the schoolhouse and down the road. Snowballs were flying thick. Up on the loads, the boys wrestled, pushing each other off into the deep drifts. Almanzo and Miles rode shouting on Miles' sled. It did not seem even a minute since they left the schoolhouse, but it took much longer to go back. First they walked, then they trotted. Then they ran, panting. They were afraid they'd be late. They're so far away from school and they've got to get back before it's time to have recess over. Then they knew they were late. Mr. Course would whip them all. The schoolhouse stood silent. They did not want to go in, but they had to. They stole in quietly. Mr. Course sat at his desk and all the girls were in their places, pretending to study. On the boys' side of the room, I'm checking to see where we're at in this book, and we're almost done with the chapter. On the boys' side of the room, every seat was empty. 
Almanzo crept to his seat in the dreadful silence. He held up his primer and tried not to breathe so loud. Mr. Corse did not say anything. Bill Ritchie and the other boys didn't care. They made all the noise they could going to their seats. Mr. Corse waited until they were quiet. Then he said, I will overlook your tardiness this one time, but do not let it happen again. Do you think they'll respect that? Everybody knew the big boys would be tardy again. Mr. Corse could not punish them because they could thrash him, and that was what they meant to do. Wow. So what do you think? Are you glad that you're not in a school like Almanzo's? Sounds really tough. These big boys, these high schoolers, are about to beat up the teacher. And poor little Almanzo is doing the best he can. Thankfully, Mr. Corse is kinder to him than Royal's teacher was. Okay, well, that is the beginning of our story. I'm looking forward to reading this with you all. Um, we have some questions to answer when you're done with it today. And I will talk to you soon. Have a wonderful day.